Well, good afternoon, everyone. Konnichiwa. I wonder what we're going to talk about today. There's nothing going on, really. But uh, I, I, what, is, what a privilege it is for me to be here as a Japan chair with my tr tremendous colleague, Patrick Cronin, to be able to, to welcome our distinguished speakers up front today. And we have a program that I think everyone will really enjoy and learn a lot from. We have two wonderful keynote speakers, and then we'll have a panel discussion afterwards. And, and I recommend what we talk about is really the importance of our collective security and defense. It's really more important than ever that we integrate our strategies and we integrate implementation of those, those strategies because we face, I think, what we can all recognize are increasing threats to our security and prosperity. Those include, of course, China's very sophisticated campaign of co-option, coercion, and concealment. The, the, state, the, the threat that is very difficult, I think, to overstate, which is the threat from North Korea's missile and nuclear programs. And what we see is many of these problems just don't stay in their separate categories. So even as we see increasing tensions and, and events uh, in the Middle East, you see, for example, a joint naval patrol between China, Russia, and Iran. And of course, as Japan knows well, and our Japanese uh, officials and, and scholars here today know well, Japan has come under increasing pressure from joint China and, and Russian uh, coercion, military coercion as well. So as we all know, the best way to preserve peace is to have a strong defense. And so a lot of what we'll talk about today is, is that theme, how to maintain our collective defense, and in particular to achieve what we all want to achieve, which is deterrence by denial, convincing adversaries that they're, they're unable, unable to accomplish their objectives through the, through the use of force. We have two wonderful keynote speakers who are going to help us uh, begin, begin this afternoon's session. I'll first I'll introduce David Helvey, and then I'll come back up and, and, and uh, introduce Satoshi Morimoto. First, David Helvey, we are so fortunate to have him in our government. He is maybe our foremost long-serving civil servant expert on Asia and Pacific security affairs. He's the acting assistant secretary of defense for Asian and Pacific security affairs. He's responsible for developing and overseeing the execution of the United States defense and security policy across the Indo-Pacific region. He has served throughout numerous administrations, steering US policy in Asia and the Indo-Pacific. For instance, he has played a leading role in formulating regional strategy reports, as well as the annual report to Congress uh, on, the, on the Chinese People's Liberation Army. Please, welcome, please join me in giving him a round of applause and a, and a warm welcome. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you very much, uh, uh, General McMaster, for your uh, uh, kind uh, um, introduction. It's, uh, it's good to see so many friends, uh, and thank you very much also for providing me an opportunity to offer a few thoughts on the evolution of the U.S.-Japan alliance. This is an important topic, and it's one that I'm very pleased to see the Hudson Institute tackling. And I'm very much looking forward to, to being able to engage in a little bit of a QA and a in the dialogue about this, about this topic this afternoon. This year, uh, we're celebrating the 60th anniversary of the signing of the Mutual, Defense, uh, Mutual Security Treaty. Uh, we have reason to look back with pride uh, with how this alliance has evolved as the cornerstone of peace and prosperity in the Indo-Pacific and that it's stronger and more relevant today than it's ever been before. The first guidelines for the US, uh, for US-Japan defense cooperation were published uh, in 1979. They permitted for the first time uh, formal defense planning between the United States and Japan. The guidelines then restricted bilateral cooperation to the defense of Japan. And it was understood in those uh, days of the Cold War as to be defense of Japan against an attack uh, specifically by the Soviet Union. Our bilateral exercise program then reflected that focus, uh, and it was limited to discussions and activities for the defense of the seas, the skies, and the territory of Japan itself. The defense guidelines were then revised again in 1997 after the end of the Cold War, and envisioned a significant uh, Japan self-defense forces support uh, to US military forces that, were, that would be engaged in conflict uh, in the region or, or in this new term that we described, uh, situations in areas uh, surrounding Japan. The self-defense forces continued to improve its de their defensive capabilities while maintaining that uh, they would not, uh, indeed could not, uh, acquire offensive capabilities. 
In 2015, the government of Japan under Prime Minister Abe revised its interpretation of Article 9 of the Constitution uh, to allow for itself a limited right of collective self-defense. Based on this interpretation, new legislation was adopted later that year to address uh, what we called seams uh, in various security situations such as gray zones, uh, peacekeeping operations, and the defense of an ally that was operating in defense of Japan. Also in 2015, the Alliance uh, again revised uh, the, the defense guidelines. An increasingly complex and unpredictable security environment in the Indo-Pacific region, uh, in our view, called for a more flexible operating model uh, for the US-Japan Alliance. Bilateral cooperation was not only expanding geographically and operationally, but it was also expanding into new domains like space uh, and cyberspace. And I'm very encouraged to note that today our bilateral exercise program is taking up the challenge uh, that we articulated together in our new revised uh, defense guidelines. Now fast forward to today, uh, we have our, our own national defense strategy and Japan has published uh, national defense program guidelines both in 2018. Now, these two strategic documents reflect uh, a profound alignment uh, across a number of important policy areas. We've got common values and a future vision uh, for a free and open Indo-Pacific. The Indo-Pacific is the priority region for us, uh, and we're committed to a robust presence uh, and partnerships across the region. We've got shared concerns between the United States and Japan uh, about the erosion of the rules-based order, uh, an order that's enabled the relative peace and growing prosperity across the Indo-Pacific region, and it's one that certainly has benefited all parties, uh, including China. An acknowledgement of the return of great power competition, and especially the challenge posed to everyone by the rise of China. Uh, embracing new domains and new technologies, such as uh, space and cyber, electronic warfare and artificial intelligence, all of these that are gonna be critical uh, to operating in the future battle space. Standing firmly together uh, to achieve the final fully verified denuc denuclearization of North Korea and the abandonment of its, all of its weapons of mass destruction programs and missile programs, and a commitment to resolve the issue of abducted Japanese citizens. Opposition to the militarization in the South China Sea and the threat to freedom of navigation and access, these are things that we share uh, with our Japanese allies. But there are a number of critical tasks before us that we, need, that we have to be focused on in order to fully implement uh, the new guidelines in our respective uh, strategic documents that, uh, that John McMaster had raised before. We need a thorough review of the roles and missions of each partner in the alliance uh, across any number of scenarios. We have to make sure that we're making the operations of the alliance more efficient. For the past several years, Japan has been acquiring significant new military capabilities, such as the F-35, Aegis Ashore, uh, MV-22 aircraft, the E-2D Hawkeye, in addition to modify, modifying its own Izumo-class destroyers in order to accommodate vertical takeoff and landing aircraft. These and other new capabilities that Japan and the United States will have in the Indo-Pacific region need to be accounted for by our alliance planners and by our future efforts. Resources uh, for both countries are not unlimited. We must look for opportunities to co-develop new technologies and enhance the alliance's overall capabilities with an eye towards interoperability. And I think our shared experience with the SM32A uh, interceptor is a prime example of this type of cooperation. We need to continue the long-term effort to increase the shared use of our military facilities in Japan and the region. Uh, not only does uh, in increasing focus on shared use promote efficiency and interoperability, but can do a lot to assure the sustainability of our presence uh, in Japan. And we have to consider how we'll adapt uh, the alliance to a post-INF environment. Now, at some point in the future, once we develop this capability, the United States will look to deploy these assets in the Indo-Pacific region, and we'll need the support of our allies in order to realize this. Sharing the costs of the stationing of US forces in Japan is also fundamental to ensuring that our presence in the region is sustainable and effective. And we look forward to a positive negotiation with our strong ally in Tokyo to determine what the fair share of those costs will be. They're certainly not easy tasks uh, that we have before us, but they're ones that we must address uh, moving forward to execute our shared vision in light of a constantly evolving and highly dynamic security environment. Indeed, as we look across the Indo-Pacific region, we can see that although China has certainly benefited from the free and open order, 
The leaders of the Chinese Communist Party are seeking to reshape the rules of that order in order to support China's rise and, and claim to great power status. We're confronted with an increasingly assertive and confident China, one that's willing to accept friction in the pursuit of its own interests. We see this manifested in a range of behaviors and activities throughout the Indo-Pacific region to include deploying advanced weapons systems to militarize disputed areas and erode the freedom of the seas. And here I do want to affirm the US position that we would be opposed to any efforts to unilaterally undermine Japan's administration of the Senkaku Islands. These are consistent with our obligations under Article 5 of our mutual security treaty. We also see China using economic coercion in an attempt to interfere in the domestic affairs of other nations. We see China promoting state-sponsored theft of other nations' military and civilian technology. And we see China extending its military presence overseas and expanding the One Belt, One Road initiative to include military ties. Plainly, uh, pardon me, China, of course, is not the only challenge uh, that we face in the Indo-Pacific region. We also see Russia's actions uh, that seek to undermine the international rules-based order. We see a deepening of Sino-Russian ties uh, with the recent joint bomber mission demonstrating the increase in opportunistic military cooperation between Beijing and Moscow. We see escalating tensions between our two allies in Northeast Asia, both the ROK and Japan. We see dangerous behavior continuing from North Korea. Uh, we see backsliding towards illiber illiberal governance in countries such as Burma and Cambodia, which challenges the norms related to human rights, religious freedom, and the dignity of every individual. We see persistent and evolving threats by non-state actors and terrorist organizations and other transnational threats such as natural disasters and the impact of climate change. These are not challenges that can be easily addressed by any one nation, but instead required a clear-eyed approach by a group of like-minded partners that share common goals. The United States-Japan Alliance is the epitome of that type of partnership and shared common goals. It's a, it's a strong partnership that's required to maintain the free and open Indo-Pacific, and it continues to serve as the cornerstone of our shared efforts throughout the Indo-Pacific region. Founded upon our shared vision for the region and energized by the strategic alignment of our defense strategies, we're pushing forward with transforming the US-Japan alliance in a way that will position us to succeed in long-term strategic competition. Some of the deliberate actions that we're taking include expanding our training and exercise program to ensure that we're prepared. We're enhancing our bilateral planning to consider high-end contingency scenarios. We're deepening our interoperability to ensure that we can act quickly and effectively uh, when needed. We're helping Japan to strengthen its capabilities uh, via foreign military sales uh, and other types of transfers of some of our most advanced technologies. We're expanding alliance cooperation into new domains such as space and cyber and in artificial intelligence. And with Japan already being our premier, our premier missile defense partner, we're continuing our partnership on initiatives that enhances both of our ballistic missile defense capabilities. <coughs> the realignment of US forces in Japan is also a critical component of our effort to ensure that our forces are geographically distributed, operationally resilient, and politically sustainable. All of these efforts combined are not intended to maintain the status quo, but rather they're intended to expand the roles and the missions and the capabilities of the US-Japan alliance in a way that strengthens our capacity and our flexibility to respond together to regional contingencies. Now, promoting a networked region that's founded upon shared values and security interests is also a top priority of both of our nations. These relationships stand as a key asymmetric advantage uh, that both the United States and, and Japan have, which is critical to our ability to project power worldwide and maintain a free and open international order. The relationships that we're continuing to strengthen in many cases alongside Japan include our efforts to deepen our relationship with Vietnam, uh, our relationship with Indonesia and the Philippines and the Pacific Islands uh, through our capacity building efforts and enhancing maritime domain awareness capabilities. Our ongoing trilateral cooperation between the United States, Japan, and Australia, or the United States, Japan, and Korea, as well as our annual US, Japan, India, Malabar exercises. Multilaterally, we've also been working closely with allies and partners on the enforcement of UN Security Council resolutions aimed at disrupting North Korea's illicit activities. And here, Japan has played a leading role in this effort uh, by hosting the enforcement coordination cell at Yokosuka, 
allowing partner nations from around the world to operate out of Japan uh, to support this effort. And this is an important example of the transparent collaboration between our allies and our partners, both at the sea and in the air, and which has allowed the President and U.S. diplomats to negotiate from a position of strength to achieve our objectives with respect to North Korea's nuclear programs. These are just a few of the relationships and efforts that highlight the priority that the United States is placing on bringing together like-minded partners that are committed to advancing a common cause and the role that the U.S.-Japan alliance can play in that. And there's certainly more work that can be done. So in conclusion, uh, the unfolding long-term strategic competition with China is going to prove to be the ch most uh, defining challenge of our generation and will likely uh, remain so beyond this generation. We remain committed to our vision for a free and open Indo-Pacific, uh, which is an affirmative and inclusive vision uh, that factors in all countries, including China, uh, that support common and enduring principles. The United States will remain fully engaged in the Indo-Pacific, prioritizing our partnerships and promoting a networked region there to ensure that a rules-based international order, not the use of force or coercion, dictates the future of the Indo-Pacific. And I'm confident that as we move forward, the United States-Japan alliance will play a central role, ensuring that the Indo-Pacific remains a region that's free and open for all. So again, thank you very much for your time. And I'd be happy to add, answer a couple of questions um, before we get the next speaker. All right, and uh, please send your questions to events at Hudson.org. Uh, yes, sir. I'm fine with that. Okay. Um, please, I saw you first. Thank you, sir. I'm a report from Lincoln American Theater. Uh, well, one of the speakers there uh, is the uh, North Korean's rhetoric against, uh, against that new strategic weapon. And, well, uh, last year when uh, Mr. Onodera, former uh, Ministry of Defense, visited Washington, D.C., he had concern that uh, if well, if it's not a long-term uh, missile, a long-range missile, it's okay. It's a very serious problem to the Japanese security, and he wished that U.S. address this problem. And my question is, uh, how is uh, U.S. and Japan addressing this issue, regardless of it being a long-range ballistic missile of North Korea this year? Well, well, thank you very much for that question. I think you know we're we're working together with our our Japanese allies uh, and others to address the full full range of of the the types of challenges that North Korea um, uh, continues to present. I mean, this is something that we addressed uh, most recently in our missile defense review, where uh, we identified North Korea is uh, continuing to present a. a a, um, a, a significant security challenge based on its missile programs and other capabilities that North Korea is developing. Uh, with, specific with specific requests to uh, North Korea's missile capabilities, we continue to work with Japan uh, to, uh, to improve our, our and our shared uh, missile defense capabilities. I had mentioned that Japan is acquiring um, Aegis Ashore as a capability to help augment its missile defense capabilities. Japan also has uh, Patriot uh, missile defense capabilities. It's something that uh, we continue to work with our Japanese uh, allies to improve their capacity, even as we continue our intense discussions uh, within the context of our alliance to understand the nature of the evolving threats to the alliance and making sure that the United States is bringing the right capabilities to bear and our allies are investing in the right capabilities to provide for their own defense. In addition to the things that we're doing bilaterally with the Japanese, we also continue to work within the context of our trilateral defense uh, relationship with our South Korean allies, uh, who are also investing in improved capabilities uh, for missile defense uh, so that we have the ability to identify, uh, track, and ultimately defend against any, any, any missile threat um, to any defended area. So thank you. Um, let's see, we'll, we'll go in the back, please. Thank you, Assistant Secretary. I'm Jin Ning Nguyen with Voice of Vietnamese Americans. I would like to hear from you how the U.S. and Japan can work together to support the capability of ASEAN in defense against China, especially in cyber security, in trade, 
Japan and the U.S., especially Japan, is leading the CPTPP. And we, you said we have expanded to cybersecurity and space. Now, ASEAN now, most of them are under the coercion of China to use Huawei. Only Vietnam is trying to abstain from it and trying to go to the U.S. for Huawei. How do you think the U.S. can help ASEAN to switch from um, their current system with Huawei to our U.S. 5G and AI and moving forward? Well, uh, uh, thank you for that question. I mean, obviously, these are these are decisions that uh, countries need to be able to make on their own. They're sovereign decisions. Uh, but one of the things that I think we're trying to do is highlight uh, the concerns that we have about certain technologies uh, or certain vendors uh, where we just see, quite frankly, the risk is being too high. Um, and I think, you know, uh, you know, we've had you know, statements from our department leadership very clearly saying that we think uh, companies like Huawei and ZTE, you know, their relationship with the Chinese government is too close. Their association with the Chinese PLA uh, is, is too close. And the legal and regulatory infrastructure in China uh, is such that, you know, they can be compelled, uh, you know, if they wouldn't do so voluntarily to cooperate with sharing data that's on their networks with the government. And from our perspective, we just see the the risks that uh, that obtain in that as being too high uh, in terms of our confidence in network security and the security of our data uh, and the security of our communications. Um, so obviously, these are decisions that countries have to make based on their own sovereign, uh, you know, determinations. But what we're trying to do, obviously, is is make sure um, that we're protecting our own networks and then we're sharing. Uh, some of the lessons learned that we have about how to ensure that our networks are appropriately protected, or if we identify threats or risks uh, with our partners, that they understand those risks uh, before they make their decisions. Um, from a DOD perspective, uh, you know, we are keenly concerned about uh, the security of our allied and partner networks, uh, because those are the networks over which we'd have to share information uh, which would be necessary to either our operations or our operations in support of our allies and partners. Um, so this is something that we do take very seriously. Thank you. Um, I think maybe two more questions, so I'll go with Russell and then this lady here. Uh, Russell Shell with the Global Taiwan Institute. <coughs> Mr. Secretary, thank you very much for your excellent remarks. Um, in your speech, you spoke about the need of the U.S.-Japan alliance uh, to respond to various contingencies. And one of the, in, the in, in, in very general terms, and I think one specific contingency, of course, is in the Taiwan Strait. And, uh, and, I'm not, um, and so my question is, uh, you know, with the upcoming elections uh, and the likelihood that the incumbent president um, may be reelected, and the even more likelihood that Beijing will likely ratchet up pressure against Taiwan, uh, both militarily, politically, diplomatically. Um, to what extent is the U.S.-Japan defense cooperation uh, planning for, preparing, uh, and possibly responding to this uh, type of uh, contingency? Thank you. Well, thank you for that question. You know, I, I don't want to get into the details of you know, internal planning uh, that we do within the context of our alliance or specific scenarios that we might be looking at. Uh, but it is clear that, that the U.S.-Japan alliance has identified peace and security in the Taiwan Strait as one of our common strategic objectives. This is not a new development. This is something that's been, that's been consistent uh, for well over a decade. Uh, so it's something that we do uh, view within the context of our alliance, but I'll just kind of leave it at that in terms of what we're specifically looking at or how we might be uh, using the different planning tools um, against any specific scenario. Thank you. Next question. Yeah. Chia Ching with United Day News Group, Taiwan. Sorry, Russell just asked my question, but I want to follow up. <laughs> if I can follow up with the um, election interfering, the Taiwan is um, saying that China is interfering in election. I wonder if U.S. is working with Japan to um, make sure that Taiwan can have a fair election. Thank you. Uh, yeah. I mean, I, I think, you know, we talk about within the context of our alliance a number of shared interests and concerns around the region. 
Um, and I'll just kind of leave it at that. I mean, we've been we've been on the record uh, in you know certainly wanting to see a, a free and fair election in Taiwan, and we would have deep concerns about any effort to do anything other than that. Um, and so I'll just kind of let the other statements of senior leaders of my government uh, kind of stand with respect to that issue. Thank you very much. David, thanks. Please join me for the round of applause. Thank you so much. Uh, appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, it's a real honor for me to have the opportunity to, to, to introduce Satoshi Morimoto, who now is he's the chancellor of Takashuko uh, University, Shoko University. He was a special advisor to the Minister of Defense and, of course, as we all know, the 11th Minister of Defense of Japan. Before that, he held several positions in the Japanese Ministry of Foreign Affairs, including director of the Security Policy Division in the Bureau of Information Analysis, Research, and Planning. He served uh, as counselor at the Japanese embassy in Nigeria and as first secretary at the Japanese embassy in the United States. Before he joined the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, he served as, uh, as the JAS, J, JASDF. But what is, I think, most important uh, is that he has an extreme, uh, extremely important legacy of all of, across all of his years in, in service. And importantly, as, as many of you know, uh, under Prime Minister Noda, he ushered in Japan's strategic shift to the Southwest Island chain. He is, he is a wise uh, public servant uh, and a scholar, and it is a real privilege for me to welcome him to Hudson. Please join me in giving a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. この伝統のある、え、かつ著名なアゾソン研究所で、え、短い時間ですが、皆さんにスピーチをさせていただく光栄に、え、よくし、大変名誉なことと思います。it is my honor to be able to make a speech, although quite short, uh, at this prominent institute, Hudson Institute, today. Thank え、昨日のように思い出される時を過ごし、ワシントンは私にとってのま、ある種心の故郷です。I worked in um, embassy of Japan in Washington in 1980 for a few years and it has been 40 years since then. Um and uh, I come back to Washington every year, but every time I come, uh, I remember those days I was working in Washington like yesterday. Uh, so in that sense, uh, Washington is my second home. Uh,要点のみお話しますが、私のスピーチのタイトルは日米防衛協力と日米同盟についてです。so moving into my speech itself, uh, since we don't have a lot of time, um, my speech title is Japan-U.S. Defense Cooperation and Japan-U.S. Alliance. It goes without saying that Japan-U.S. Defense Cooperation is the linchpin that supports the backbone of Japan-U.S. Alliance. 他方トランプ大統領がしばしば指摘しておられますように日米安保体制は不平等だという不満が冷戦期からアメリカの中で存在してきたと思います。on the other hand, as pointed out frequently by President Trump, there has been a long-standing frustration since the Cold War period in the United States that Japan-U.S. security arrangement is unfair. Anpo条約第5条は日本の姿勢のもとにある領域に対する武力攻撃に対し日米が共同して対処するよう規定しており 
アメリカから見ると日本,日,本道日本防衛上の義務を負っているように、まあ、見えるが一方アメリカへの攻撃があった場合には日本には米国防衛の義務を,を規定していないのでアメリカとしては同盟国としての不公平感があることは理解できるところです。US Japan Security Treaty, our Article 5, provides for the bilateral actions in response to an armed attack against territories under administration of Japan. It therefore gives an impression that the United States is responsible for defending Japan, while Japan, as an ally, is not obligated to defend the United States should the US be attacked. しかし、安保条約は第6条において、米軍が日本の安全に寄与し、極東における平和及び安全の維持に寄与するため、米軍が日本の施設区域を使用することができるようになっています。However, the treaty also stipulates in its Article 6 that Japan provides space and facilities to the US military to support the US contribution to the security of Japan, as well as the peace and stability of the Far East. 冷戦期以来、今日まで、これがアメリカの国益にとっていかに大きな国益であったか、利益であったかということについては、えー、皆さんにも十分理解していただけると思います。しかし、それでもなお、日米安保体制は不平等だという意見が存在してき、えー、たわけですが、あそこにはですね、えー、日米安保ただの理論に代表される安保体制の不平等感がありこれを払拭し、えー、保管するために日本は冷戦期から冷戦後を通じて在日米軍の安定的駐留のために多大な政治的経済的外交的貢献をしてきました。Nonetheless, there has always been this perception that the pact is one sided. So, in the effort to dispel this perception of the unfair arrangement or Japan's freeloading of the treaty and to further strengthen the mutual support, Japan has, since during the Cold War and after, made a great deal of contribution politically, economically, diplomatically to ensure stable stationing of the US forces in Japan. 在日米軍基地の安定的使用のために日本は努力してきました。Japan has made effort for the US military to be able to station stably in Japan. ホストネーションサポートも世界のモデルと言われるほど支払ってきました。Japan has also ensured that,、uh, sorry,、uh, Japan has also paid a significant amount of in the host nation's support, which is now called the model case in the world. FMS による各種のアメリカ製兵器も購入してきました。Japan has also purchased various weapons through FMS. ガイドラインに基づく防衛協力やアジア太平洋における共同訓練。共同活動にも積極的に参加してきました米国の勧告もあり途上国にいろいろな戦略的援助も行ってきました。And based on the US recommendation, Japan has also provided strategic support to developing countries. さらに、平和安保体制に基づく限定的な集団的自衛権の行使は、こうした不満の多くを解消する重要な役割であったと確信しています。
Furthermore, limited exercise of the right of collective self-defense based on the military legislation has surely played an important role in the effort to resolve such dissatisfaction. ありまさに日本の安全保障の担当者はこの不平等感を補完するために人力をしてきたと考えています。I have been working with the US uh, Japan Security Treaty for a very long time and for the last 50 years I've been working and tried to dispel this uh, perception of um, unfairness uh, regarding this treaty. And indeed, alliance managers also have been working very hard to uh, do away with this perception as well. Today, I do not think there is any element in the arrangement that indicates unfairness. Nevertheless, we might be requested to shoulder a significant portion of cost in the host nation support discussions for the next fiscal year. I would like to come back to this topic later. On the other hand, uh, the changes in the security environment in Northeast Asia surrounding Japan is now posing greater challenges to the two allied countries. Also, Russia among others, maritime advancement by China based on their ambition for hegemony, uh, A2AD, as well as uh, provocative actions by North Korea, including nuclear and missile development and enhancement of defense in the area surrounding Russian territories are direct threats to Japan and the US, and these threats are growing year by year. If these situations escalate further, they might eventually evolve into gray zone situations and into hybrid conflicts. Japan US Alliance will, in order to be ready to respond to such situations, review the respective RMC and pursue them. Snawachi, Shorai no Koriuru, Jitaini, Tayo Srutamenywa, Genzai no RMC, Ni Okeru, Soku no Bubun, O Ninshiki. I say this because in order to respond to possible incidents in the future, we need to identify the insufficiencies in the current RMC and work on them so that we can further strengthen the alliance. 習近平主席は積極的な外交安全保障環境政策に転じ南シナ海や東シナ海に出て 
人工島を建設し、第一列島線を越えて空母、爆撃機が出てくるようになっています。Xi Jinping, who assumed the position in 2012,、uh, shifted gear to active diplomacy and security policy. Under Xi, China ventured out to South China Sea and East China Sea and built islands. And now their aircraft carriers and bombers go outside of the first island chain. China is pursuing its One Belt, One Road initiative, building infrastructures in the territories along the Silk Road all the way to Europe, and is trying to protect its core interests by projecting its maritime and military power to the open ocean. 国内では先端技術を入手して軍民融合に利用し情報通信技術の革新的発展により世界のデジタル経済を支配しているように見えます。Domestically, China is driving innovation in telecommunication technologies by utilizing the most advanced technology and the military civil fusion with an objective to rule the digital economy of the world. 多くの専門家は中国が経済発展をするとゆっくりと自由で民主主義的な社会が広がっていくという思い込みをして対中関与政策を進めてきました。Up to today, many experts have promoted the policy of engagement with China under the misconception that as China develops economically, free and democratic society will gradually take hold in the country. しかし実際には中国は財政が豊かになれば軍事力に投資を進め対外的には覇権主義を進め米国の軍事優位や技術優位が損なわれつつあることに気がついたのではないかと思います。To the contrary, once it became rich, China invested in military capability, pursued hegemonism, and became aware that US superiority in military and technology might be fading. 米国はそこで今から2年前の2017年12月以降、中国を戦略的競争相手とみなして政策を進めてきました。この政策は正しい方向に進んでいると思います。To this, the US United States responded by establishing a strategy two years ago、uh, in December 2017 and recognized that China was the strategic competitor. I believe this is the right direction as a policy.、えー、現在の米中関係は経済面で貿易問題。対米、えー、投資あるいは米国の知的財産、えーえー、の確保などを進めていますがもともと経済は相互依存状態にありますので米中いずれか一方があ一方的な関係に進むとは考えにくいのではないかと思います。On the economic front, the United States and China are involved in issues such as a trade deficit and investment in the US and the protection of、uh, American IP. But since two economies are already quite interdependent, neither country is likely to make a unilateral move. しかし、安全保障面では、中国の一帯一路、海洋進出、軍事力の近代化などは、大きな懸念材料であり、米中間で妥協の余地はないと思います。On the other hand, on the security front, a China's OBOR initiative, maritime advancement and military modernization are grave concerns, and there is no room for concession between China and the US. 時間を省略するために、中国がアメリカに対してどういう政策を
取っていたかを細かくお話しする時間が十分ないのでそれを省略しこれから日米同盟はどのように進めていけばよいのかについて最後にお話をしようと思います。In the interest of, of time, I will not go into、uh, what kind of policies、uh, were taken by China towards the US, but I would like to now talk about、uh, what kind of alliance that we should go towards between Japan and the US. 一言で言うと、RMC、すなわち能力と任務と、えー、役割、えー、を強化するということにつきますが、このうち日米両国が最も急速に強化すべきことは、日本の対応能力であると思います。In one word, RMC is the most important issue that we need to work on between the two countries, but among the elements within our roles, mission, and capability, the most urgent in strengthening,、uh, strengthening is the Japan's response capability. 日本は中型の駆逐艦と潜水艦をさらに増やして東シナ海を中心とした海上防衛力を強化すべきだと思います。Japan should further increase the number of mid-sized destroyers and submarines to enhance maritime defense capability in the area centering on East China Sea。また、ストーブル機のプラットフォームとして、えー現在 DDH を回収する計画を進めていますが将来はワスプ級の強襲揚陸艦が必要になると思います。Furthermore,、uh, right now there is a plan to upgrade DDH、um, to become a platform for s t o v o aircrafts, but in the future I do believe that、uh, we will need WASP class amphibious assault shipping. 中国の空母が常時太平洋に進出してくる時期はもな間もなく来ると考えているからです。Uh, soon, 日本はすでに147機の F35 戦闘機を取得する計画を明らかにしていますが、将来戦闘機については、日米共同で次世代の戦闘機を共同開発して現在の F2 と2030年代の中頃以降に交代させる必要があると思います。Japan has already announced its plan to acquire 147 F 35 fighters, but for the future, we will also need to work together、uh, to jointly develop the sixth generation fighters and replace F 2s by mid 2030s and on. さらに、長射程のミサイルを装備して、艦艇、航空機から発射されるミサイルに対抗するとともに、極超音速滑空体を含む従来とは異なる弾道を飛翔するミサイルやロケットに対応できるミサイル防衛システムを改良する必要があると思います。It is also indispensable to develop and improve a missile defense system that includes long range missiles that would enable responding to missiles launched from ships and aircrafts, as well as missiles and rockets with non conventional trajectories such as hypersonic glide vehicles. Boost phase における迎撃ミサイルや宇宙利用における、えー、初期段階での迎撃能力を検討することも必要になるでしょう launch, phase, well. マルチドメイン能力のうち宇宙とサイバー能力を日米協力によって一層充実させることは急務であると思います。Another urgent issue is the,、uh, among the multi domain capabilities, space and cyber capability must be enhanced quickly through cooperation、uh, between Japan and the US. 日本は来年度予算でマルチドメインの予算を重視していますが、特に
宇宙における日米協力を進め太平洋空域におけるコンステレーションを多数の小型衛星によって運用するシステムを進めることが適切であると思います。Japanese government has emphasized the multi domain element in the defense budget for the next fiscal year.、Uh, it is necessary、uh, to push forward the cooperation between the two countries in the space domain and go forward with a constellation comprising of multiple small satellites for the airspace above the Pacific Ocean. The Juntenchon hosted payload is a very important thing, but it is not a good thing. The Juntenchon 協力をもってインド太平洋における宇宙監視と海洋監視のネットワークを構成することが望ましいと思います。Um, hosted payload on quasi d e n i s satellite system is an important element, but this alone is not adequate. Japan, US, and Australia must work together in the Indo Pacific Ocean,、uh, Indo Pacific,、uh, to create a network of surveillance for both space and maritime. 最後に、ロールミッションについては、えー、南西方面に設置している自衛隊の施設や米軍の施設を完全に日米共同使用にするほか日本の重要基地についても共同使用を拡充する必要があると思います。And for roles and mission parts of the RMC, the role of Japan US security arrangement should be enhanced. Of the bases in Japan, SDF's facilities and US military facilities located in the southwestern region should be completely joint use facilities between Japan and the US. And in key bases such as SDF bases in western and central regions, as well as missile base, the joint use should be expanded. GAM の基地も日米行の GO の共同使用にして常時多国間の共同演習ができるようにすることも望ましいと思います。It would also be desirable to jointly use the Guam base among three countries, Japan, US, and Australia, so that multilateral joint exercise can be carried out at any time. ミサイル防衛については今後の問題でありいろいろな議論があると思いますが、いずれにしても中国の有する多数の各種のミサイルに対応できる能力を持つことはアジアのアメリカの同盟国としてはどうしても必要であると思います。Although missile defense is a future issue and requires further discussions,、uh, it is necessary for the US to deploy a capability in Asia、uh, to respond to numbers of missiles in inland of China and ballistic missiles. また、日米豪が中心になって ASEAN 諸国に対する海空の装備、えー、を提供すること。日米インドが中心になって南西アジアに同様の装備支援を進めることも意味があると考えています。It is also、um, significant for the US, Japan, and Australia to provide、uh, equipment to the ASEAN countries, and also Japan, US, and India to provide the same、uh, type of equipment to Southwest Asian countries. こうした RMC の能力を向上するためには、日本の防衛費を、えー、対 GDP で 1.2% まで引き上げる必要が出てくると思います。And in order to drive such enhancement of RMC,、uh, Japan will need to increase its defense budget up to 1.2% of its GDP. 来年度や今年度こ、えー大会計年度、えー、交渉する予定のホストネーションサポートについてはこれから日米間で話し合う、えー、ことになっていますが従来の日米地位協定に基づく、えー、経費の分担に加えて日米協力で進めるための戦略的な経費例えば宇宙やサイバーに関する日米協力あるいは戦略部隊や
インド太平洋部隊の活動に必要な経費、並びに在日米軍の基地の共同使用にかかる経費などを負担することも検討する必要があると考えます。As to host nations' support that is to be discussed in the next fiscal year,、um, in addition to the contribution that is set in the status of force agreement,、uh, we might also need to consider bearing strategic cost for advancing Japan US cooperation,、uh, such as costs associated with Japan US cooperation in space and cyber,、uh, cost of activities by strategic unit and also by Indo Pacific unit, and also costs for expanding the joint use of US bases in Japan. あまりに細部にわたりましたが、ともかく日米同盟の下で、えー、日米の任務と役割と、えー、能力の拡大を図っていくこと、これが今後の日米防衛協力の最も重要なテーマであることを強調し、私のスピーチを終わることとします。So, I talked about、uh, on many different topics, but what I want to emphasize at this point again is that、um, going forward, the、uh, basis for the Japan US alliance will be the expansion and enhancement of RMC between the two countries. And、uh, in that sense,、uh, Japan US defense cooperation will continue to be very important and need to be enhanced. Thank you. Thank you so much, Minister, and, and,、uh, and for. To, uh, to Acting Assistant Secretary of Defense、uh, Helvey. And now we're just going to have something even better, I think, which is a panel that will give, I think, give our panel members an, an opportunity to make some initial remarks、uh, and then hear what's on your minds. And this is when you can send your questions to events at, at,、uh, at, at uh, Hudson.org. So we have, we have an extremely talented panel today, really, that brings complementary perspectives to the importance of our, our collective defense cooperation. First Lieutenant General Koichi Jiro、uh, Bansho. He's a retired Lieutenant General,、uh, fellow retired Lieutenant General, <laughs> and he's a senior advisor、uh, to the Marubeni、uh, uh, Corporation. In 2004, he commanded the first Japanese contingent to Iraq. He deployed to Al Samoa, and, and,、uh, and, and I'll just tell you, I've h a v i n g visited there many times. It was just a wonderful operation that made such an important difference. To the Iraqi people in the area. And it was under your leadership where all that got started. It's great to be on this panel with you. In 2011, after the Great East Japan earthquake and nuclear disaster in Fukushima, he was assigned chief of the Japan US Bilateral Coordination Center for Operation Tomodachi, the first Japan US bilateral disaster relief operation. In 2012, he became vice chief of staff,、uh, JGSDF, and commander of the Western Army of Japan. From 2013 to 2015. Welcome, General. Real pr- privilege to have you. Sujio Ta- Takahashi、uh, is the Chief of Policy Simulation Office at the National Institute for Defense Studies in Tokyo. Extremely important mission to, 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 to identify and, and clarify those, theme, those themes、uh, potentially in our defense that David Helvey talked about and then what kind of capabilities we as an alliance can develop. Uh, to, to, cover those, to cover those themes. He was a deputy director of the Office of Strategic Planning of Ministry of Defense from 2008 to 2016. In that capacity, he was in a, a drafting team of the National Defense Program Guidelines. And, and you heard Dave,、uh, David Helvey talk about the alignment, the tremendous alignment in our, in our strategies as a result uh, of, uh, uh, of Takahashi san's efforts.、Um, Patrick Cronin is the Asia. 
Pacific Security Chair at Hudson Institute. And, and uh, Patrick's research program analyzes the challenges and opportunities confronting the United States in the Indo-Pacific region, including China's total competition campaign, what I referred to in the introduction as, as this campaign of co-option, coercion, and concealment. Well, he also works on the future of the Korean Peninsula and strengthening U.S. alliances and partnerships. And I, I know of no scholar who has worked harder and, and longer and official uh, at, at strengthening the, the U.S.-Japan alliance. Sheila Smith is a senior fellow for Japan Studies at the Council on Foreign Relations. She's an expert in Japanese politics and foreign policy. She's the author of several books on the subject, including a book I'm reading right now, Japan Rearmed, The Politics of Military Power. She also teaches as an adjunct professor at the Asian Studies Department at Georgetown University and serves on the board of its Journal of Asian Affairs. So what I'd like to do is, is just suggest maybe we go in that, that order. Uh, and I'm and, oh, sorry. Oh. Sorry, Another separate page. <laughs> no, Lieutenant General. Right, there, there's too many Lieutenant Generals. <laughs> and then, of course, we, of course, we have Lieutenant General Ch Chip Gregson, uh, Marine Corps retired, who most recently served as the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Asian and Pacific Security Affairs from 2009 to 2011. He has a tremendous reputation across, not just in the Marine Corps, but across all of our defense community and, and all of our services. And he's mentored a lot of my fellow Army officers who think the world of him as well. In the Marine Corps, he served as a commander of U.S. Marine Forces Pacific, commanding general Fleet Marine Force Pacific, and commander of U.S. Marine Corps Bases Pacific, headquartered at Camp H.M. Smith in Hawaii. So it's a, a tremendous panel. I recommend we just go in that order. General Gregson, if you're OK to, to, do, to, uh, to back clean up there, <laughs> all right? And, uh, and, and, and we'll begin uh, first with, uh, with, with uh, General Bonsha. Thank you very much, General McMaster, and uh, distinguished panelists and uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it is a great honor for me to be here. And uh, this is a privilege for me. As a soldier, I'd like to do my presentation by using the PowerPoint slide. <laughs> <coughs> so I'd like to introduce the three points. One is the, as of uh, Japanese strategic environment and uh, strategic characteristic. Number two is the Japanese effort, especially to cope with China. Third is uh, how to strengthen our alliance. So this is a globe. Why is Japan? Japan is here from uh, North, Northern Territory, Hokkaido, Honshu, Kyushu, and the Ryukyu Islands, Southwestern Islands. So the distance itself is 3,500 kilometers from north to south, and located at between the European continent and the Pacific Ocean. And especially, this Japan archipelago is located between those important areas to control the pathways and exit from a continent. So, Sea of Okhotsk, Sea of Japan, East China Sea, South China Sea. And this yellow belt is the Japan archipelago. I think Japan's archipelago is very important location and uh, plays a very important role in taking power balance in the Indo-Pacific region. According to the U.S. national security strategy, uh, as, uh, uh, so as you know very well, China and Russia is a strategic competitor. And uh, North Korea and Iran is the threat to the United States and uh, allies. But the three of force, China, Russia, and North Korea, is located here. And Japan is the only country to face directly those three powers. And uh, I think, I always think about the deja vu from the 19th century. As you know, 
Sino-Japanese War happened in 1894 and the Russo-Japanese War, 1904. Almost 120 years ago, we spent uh, almost the same strategic environment. I'd like to touch upon the one example of the Chinese provocative actions. Apple chart is a violation of the Japanese in territorial water by the Chinese Bissell. Until the, after the, uh, 2012, Japanese government decided to nationalization of the Senkaku Islands. The violation was increased. And still a couple of days ago, Chinese Bissell invaded our territorial water. And the uh, latter bars indicate the number of the scrambles by the air Air Defense Force. Since the 1958, almost 60 years ago, that started, and the highest mountain is 944 times a year. That is 1984, during the Cold War, mainly to the Soviet aircraft. But after the collapse of the, uh, after the end of the Cold War, that number was decreased. And again, since the last 10 years, that is increased again. And uh, three years ago, the recorded the highest number, 1,168 times. And almost uh, 1,000 times a year, the, uh, uh, our scrambles by our jet is conducting. But the problem itself is the content. Almost 60 to 17 percent of the air interception scrambles towards the Chinese aircraft. So how do we do? We have to do many things, but I pointed out five things. One is our capability must be strengthened. And uh, our Japan-US Security Alliance is critically important. And especially, we have to promote the FOIP, free and open Indo-Pacific strategy. And we have to consider the counterbalancing and as uh, Minister Morimoto said, we need more money and resources to defend and to conduct such a things. And especially, I'd like to emphasize on the archipelagic defense. As I explained, Japanese archipelago is located as a very important strategic location and the geopolitical locations. That's why we have to conduct many things. But I pointed out the four things. One is we have to establish a strategic superiority along first and second island chain. We have to do all effort to deter and contain from Eurasian power. And uh, uh, we have to control the geopolitical exit. Second is uh, our Japanese own effort. We have to deploy mo and the moder modernization of the weapons, especially long-range capabilities might be very important. And uh, sustainability and resiliency is also very important things to conduct such capabilities. Third is uh, we have to accelerate the cost-imposing strategy by the uh, asymmetrical ways. That is not only for the military, but also a political, diplomatic, economic ways. And uh, we have to seek the superiority in the cyberspace, and uh, electric magnetic field. And I would like to say one more thing. That is the amphibious capabilities. General Gregson did a great support for us. Uh, we recently established the ARDB, stand for the Amphibious Readiness Deployment Brigade. That is the MEB type uh, forces. Uh, we need to strengthen the quality and the quantity. And we have to soft, uh, so, uh, proceed the joint capabilities and uh, Japan-US cooperation. And uh, one of the so, uh, important things is, uh, as I mentioned, as, uh, archipelagic defense. But especially, southern areas is critically important. This is Honshu. From uh, Kyushu to Okinawa areas, it's uh, almost the same size of the Honshu. 
the distance is 1,600 kilometers, almost 1,000 miles from north to south. But that is the many remote islands and face to the East China Sea and the Korean Peninsula. So that's why we have to strengthen the defense posture along these areas. Three measures. One is unit location. Second is uh, rapid deployment capabilities must be strengthened and the amphibious capabilities also. In our headquarters, we called Southwestern War Strategy in those days. It means those islands must be secured because we have to secure our people, our land, our bases. Land itself must be kept. And second is an asymmetrical coastal defense by using the thermal weapons. And third is a forward defense. So this is a kind of the Japanese type A to AD. This is the, our new unit location. On 2016, uh, 2016 uh, we established a new camp in Yonaguni. That is a very close to Taiwan, only 110 kilometers uh, distance from Taiwan. This is the border island. And uh, last year, we established the Miyako and Amami here and here. Red line is a, a candidate of the Chinese exit line. So uh, we have to control those areas. And maybe in the near future, Shigaki uh, will be uh, so completed to the new camps. I think there is no choke point without land. So, Land, island is very important. Uh, this is the air defense capabilities, Japanese made, surface to air missile and the Patriot. And this is a very similar, but this is a surface to surface missile, uh, type 12. And also, as you know, China conducts three warfares, such as the media warfare, psychological warfare, and the legal warfare. But I think we have three more warfares. Fourth is a legitimacy based on the international law or rule-based orders. Such kind of the legitimacy is very important. And the fifth warfare is high prophecy or high capabilities of the armed forces, military forces. And the sixth is a friend, US-Japan relationship, crowd, India, Australia, ASEAN countries, European countries. Such kind of the multilateral cooperation must be very important. This year is the 60 years anniversary of the US-Japan security relationship. Uh, Prime Minister Kishi is the grandfather of the Prime Minister Abe, and uh, President Eisenhower signed 60 years ago in Washington, DC. So we have to strengthen the, our bond of the US-Japan alliance. As Mr. Morimoto said, RMC is very important. And based on the, before that, strategic goals, strategic objectives might be aligned. And uh, we have to create and conduct a cost imposing strategy to copy to China and uh, strengthen the joint use of bases of facilities. And we have to demonstrate many activities, such as exercises or trainings, and promote joint technology development. This is the overview of this region. Hard balancing conducted by Japan and US to continental powers, especially China. And quarter cooperation, Japan, US, and Australia and India. And the soft balancing is ASEAN countries mainly and also multilateral cooperation with European countries also. This is the last slide. This picture was taken on last December, uh, October in Kyushu. This is a very important asset. This is a high mass of the US Army. And this is the Type 12 surface to surface missile of the Japan uh, Self Defense Force. Both soldiers stood. But this is a very important strategic message. HIMARS is a rocket system. 
capable for the long-range missile. And the system is also to control the threat along the uh, coastal line. So we need the wisdom, and we need all measures to cope with security situation. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. At first thing, I want to say great thanks to Hudson Institute to uh, hold this event and invite me to here because I'm a nuclear, nuclear strategy specialist and I'm very, very big fan of Harman Kahn. So uh, Hudson Institute, as well as the Rand, Rand Corporation, Hudson Institute is very special organization for myself. And uh, what I want to say here is actually almost has been already covered by General Banshee and Morimosan. You know, to say a long story in short, I want to say we need to, I mean, the US and Japan should start uh, another round of world mission capability talks uh, as soon as possible. Because now, you know, as you, as you know, the, there are so many security challenges in the region, North Korea, China, or you know, new domains, or Middle East, other, other parts of the region. And also, uh, we have some significant challenge in alliance management, like host nation support, or uh, post INF issues, or uh, new fighter development. So these things, these specific alliance management issues should be linked, should be treated with linking, uh, with strongly linking with strategic concept. So what we need to now is to develop the common strategic concept which can address these specific, these specifics, these specific alliance issues. You know, uh, in case of you know, host nation support, needless to say about host nation support, but you know, fighter or post INF issue could be could tend to be a, a deficit in alliance management if they if alliance manager treat them as without any strategic foundation. You know, HNS is money issue, so money issue always can harm your friendship relation. So this is very serious, but you know. At the same time, under the current security environment, we need to modernize or update uh, military infrastructure in Northeast Asia because you know, we, have, we are facing serious threat, serious challenge from Chinese anti-access area denial capabilities. So this reinforcing, strengthening the base resiliency is a top priority agenda, actually. So, and the strengthening base resiliency requires huge money. So in a sense, you know, one of the how to say, creative idea, potential creative idea is to develop a new underground uh, missile storage inside some, some areas, some places in, in US by Japanese fund. Of course, that is a very, uh, un, un, very expensive because this is underground. But because this is underground, this is a resident. And the, so uh, that kind of, how to say, fund for strategic purpose would be justifiable in, uh, in uh, how to use how to use the Japanese taxpayers' money. So that kind of link between strategic how to say concept, a strategic story with each uh, HNS issue is really uh, important. And fighter or well, post INF as well. Fighter issue and post INF is I think this is a very this this is a kind of not the same coin, but the the issues based on the same foundation. I mean, uh, now the missile technology has developed. Now, you know, pressure, pressure strike regime is not only employed by the United States. China also can employ the PGN. And uh, so now, you know, air war is going to be changed. You know, for, for, for since, since World War I, uh, you cannot, uh, it is very difficult to Destroy the aircraft on the field, uh, but so it, it's more easier to it's, it's it's easier to shoot down as the air. But now the long range, even the long range missile can shoot, can destroy aircraft on the ground. So this is a big change, and so in this sense, you know the and the combining with uh, unmanned technology, that air war itself can is going to be changed. So if air war, the characteristic characteristics of air war is changed. Why we need manned, effort, manned fighter? Well, no, the requirement for manned fighter might be different 
from the previous era. So these kind of issues, how to win the, how to fight the war, how to win the war, would determine the uh, direction or how to say requirement of the fighter and the requirement for the post and uh, ground based strike system. So in this way, we need to discuss that kind of upstream strategic issues to address downstream spe alliance, uh, specific issues of the alliance management. So uh, in US-Japan alliance, uh, as, as, Dave, as, as Dave explained, uh, we did several, how to say, defense strategies slash operational uh, documents, like, like US-Japan defense guidelines. And the latest one was uh, signed in 19, uh, 20, 2015. That was a very big achievement, but five years uh, is going to be passed. So we should start the, the another round. And the defense guideline is actually to link strategy with operation planning. And uh, now I think we, I, we need to link strategy with capabilities. So in this context, I say uh, this is not this is not uh, the new round should not be the reviewing another defense guidelines, but to uh, for, formulate new notion of roles, mission, and capabilities. And you know, these five years, uh, multi domain issue is more serious. Of course, that was serious in like 20, 2015 as well. But now it's more serious. And Chinese. Uh, Eta anti accessory dinner capability is, of course, it is also serious. And now we are facing the, great, the era of the great power competition, which we are not recognizing in like 20, 2015. So, uh, so these things, thinking to, to, concerning these things, we need to start that kind of strategic, how to say, consultation for to develop the strategic concept. Without that, we may face a very serious alliance management friction. To avoid that, we need to do that. And then finally, I want to have one comment uh, in, in, in the context of North Korea. And then, uh, you know, uh, North Korea is changing the game. Actually, actually has been changing the game. Because in the, until maybe early 2000s, uh, Korean Peninsula and the Japan, Japanese islands are actually the different theater. Combat would suppose, supposed to have on, to happen only within the Korean Peninsula, and Japan was considered as a safe staging area. And uh, however, uh, with the North Korean ballistic missiles, now Japan can be the combat area as well. So now you know Korean Peninsula and Japanese theater is uh, integrated in one theater. And uh, however, the alliance structure of this region is a actual re legacy of 1950 Korean War. You know, in, after, after the 1950 Korean War, US ROK alliance is signed, and the US Japan original US Japan Security Treaty was signed in 1950, before US Japan US ROK Security Treaty, to support US operation in Korean Peninsula, and the uh, and then the Japan, US Japan Security Treaty was was revised in 1960s, and it, this means US Japan Security Treaty or US Japan alliance is supposed to be supposed to support. U.S. ROK alliance, or U.S. military operation going pension. So the current regional command and control structure is based on this structure. And based on the assumption that we have two different theater. However, now we have one theater. So we need to uh, fundamentally reconsider command and control arrangement in this theater. In other words, now Japan need to have face some cost, some risk, if Japan support U.S. operation in Korean Peninsula by North Korean missiles. And uh, so this, is, this situation is something like a taxation without representation. Mm -hmm. So now we want to have the representation in Korean Peninsula situation. So we should, I, I'm asking uh, for US side to review the command and control structure for truly trilateral one. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. Patrick. Hey, John, thank you very much. Um, if there's one word that summarizes what we need to do to update U.S. defense cooperation, for me, the word is information. But I expand what that information uh, definition is in three points here. First, I do want to emphasize as an American that the U.S.-Japan alliance is and remains and will remain the cornerstone of the free and open Indo-Pacific. Um, it goes without saying with most of uh, the folks in this room, but it's important to be said publicly. Um, our goal 
is not to remain satisfied, though, with the status quo, because the environment is constantly changing. And that's why the US and Japan must push ourselves, must push our governments and our societies to keep up with these vital changes. So point two, when I think about the most vital challenge, it was echoed by Acting Assistant Secretary David Helvey. He said the defining challenge is the China challenge for the century. I think he's right. Um, this is our biggest national security challenge. It's shared by the United States and Japan, and it will be the defining challenge in the coming decades. As we look at what China's doing, it's not just defense. Mm -hmm. It's not even mostly defense. And that's why we're going to have to expand the definition of what. So I'm going to break the crockery here of what it means to have defense cooperation. We can't just do defense cooperation. We need national security cooperation. We need it writ large. Because China is using all instruments of power to gain primacy. This has been described as political warfare ever since George Kennan defined the term after World War II. But others, including many Japanese, uh, talk about the gray zone operations, which China is using to alter the status quo uh, without overt military escalation. I've written with my colleague Ryan Newhart in a report that will be released on Thursday online called Total Competition that emphasizes China's peaceful but comprehensive policy for gaining, first and foremost, economic preeminence. That's their main goal. Read Jonathan Ward's book about this. Their goal is economic preeminence. But to get there, they want to change the rules to make them favorable to Beijing. They want to chiefly do this through technological prowess. And the technologies that get them to that economic preeminence, unfortunately, are dual use, and they lead to military preeminence. So these are all connected. That's why that civil military fusion concept of China is something we need to learn from, um, because this is what uh, is the key to the future security. So my third point is, therefore, the US-Japan alliance must step up to the challenge of China's total competition. And that means not just more and smarter defense cooperation, but strategic cooperation across the dimensions of Beijing's approach, the economic, legal, psychological, military, and informational. The economic power needs to be countered with strong, growing economies, but also by things that are now being done by the US, Japan, and other allies, like the Blue Dot Network, to provide uh, essentially a grade, a um, good housekeeping seal of approval or disapproval on China's infrastructure financing uh, for its Belt and Road Initiative that we've heard about. Um, it's also proceeding with a, an effective, robust bilateral trade agreement. Um, it, it means dealing with development in Southeast Asia and providing them alternatives to the Belt and Road Initiative. All of those and more need to be done on the economic side. The lawfare side uh, is very important because the legal arguments that China makes are about adopting the rule of law as it suits Beijing's interests. So they're happy to embrace international law or local regional norms when it suits their interests, and they're happy to violate them when it doesn't. Um, you could say this is classic major power behavior to some extent. Yes, there's some truth there, but we live in the 21st century when we're hoping to agree on rules-based system, one that Japan and the United States has built up so assiduously, especially since the end of World War II, that we're trying to enforce. So when China notes that it is ratified the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, but then it completely ignores the 2016 Arbitral tr Tribunal ruling on the South China Sea, are they supporting international law? No, they're not supporting international law, but they'll take America to task for not ratifying UNCLOS, even though we're actually supporting it, um, and so on. Uh, they're trying to do the same thing with a one-sided code of conduct in the South China Sea, uh, where they're trying to sort of co-opt those norms. You mentioned the word co-option. Uh, while they conceal their real intent about exploiting resources in denying military exercises and therefore defense of those Southeast Asian countries uh, through a code of conduct, through a legal means. Um, a third dimension, psychological operations, is more than what the military usually refers to. I'm using this very broadly in terms of how Chinese has adopted it. Yes, General Bancho mentioned the three warfares. That's a PLA concept of their military concept. I'm losing it in the, in the round here, their larger concept of psychological operations. Um, because they are constantly messaging in ways that are not just propagandistic, but are meant to literally change the ideas of thinkers, of leaders, of officials, of the press, of the media, of academe, um, and in ways that are truly uh, strategic. Um, so the idea right now for China, the big meme, is that it's the United States that's the rule breaker. China's making, you know, keeping up the rules. China's supporting 
the global economy. The United States is tearing apart the global economy. The United States is the biggest destabilizing force in the region. China is the biggest stabilizing force in the region. So these are all psychological warfare and not just propagandistic uh, dimensions. I could go on, and we do in the report. The military dimension, and it's especially maritime in East Asia, in East China Sea, in the South China Sea, um, absolutely vital to China's approach. Beijing wants to create a defense force that's capable of nullifying America's power projection capabilities, separating Japan from the United States. Because if they can do that, dealing with Japan becomes a lot easier. Dealing with South Korea becomes a lot easier. Dealing with the Philippines, Vietnam, uh, Indonesia become a lot easier. Um, and they want to do that. They want to be able to, uh, that's where the A2, the anti-access air denial kinds of capabilities come in that we have to counter. This a lot, big dimension of this is happening under the sea. And this is when you think about the dual use. So you think about the artificial intelligence colony that China is building um, with unmanned undersea vehicles. And you think about what they're systematically mapping the seabeds and thinking about where the cyber cables are going. You start to see a much murkier uh, picture about what is China really doing here? Is this for the benefit of all humankind? Or is this about China's hegemony? Uh, is this about severing the military alliance uh, system? Is this about changing the rule of law? Is this about advancing Chinese uh, power? Uh, and unfortunately, it comes down to this fifth dimension, information, information power. Information is the one word that permeates everything that China is doing, I would submit. Now, there are many things we have to do. It's been said. I'm not saying this is the only thing we have to do, but it's the one that has to be elevated, I believe, in the, in the security and defense cooperation. From the battle of narratives, from dealing with cyber attacks, from dealing with China's big data, AI, space exploration, information hard points that they're building in the South China Sea, China's strategic uh, defense, um, about exploiting information. This is what it's uh, centered on. And the US and Japan must counter this. They must, we must leverage our advantages in these areas, because we have many, and we must leverage them against China's long-term weaknesses when it comes to the free flow of information, to transparency, to cutting edge technologies, to undersea warfare, to space systems. So for instance, a joint US co-development initiative centered on C4 ISR would help to counter this massive challenge. That would be one specific kind of initiative that could be launched where the major defense component, but it's a national security uh, widely conceived. So in short, to succeed in updating US-Japan defense cooperation, I believe we must uh, expand our operations uh, of our cooperation, or the aperture of our cooperation into not only the new domains, but also uh, throughout all policy instruments and information is the one that permeates all of them. So thank you. Thank you, Patrick. Sure. Thank you, General. Um, so I'm here not as an operator um, or, an, or a planner, but rather as somebody who looks at the politics of the decision making. And I think the I think all of us up here are talking about not only how trying to sustain current levels of alliance cooperation, but how to make the alliance stronger. And I'm going to focus my remarks a little bit on the politics. Everybody here has acknowledged that the rapid changes afoot in the geopolitics of Asia are accelerating, and we have to be responsive to that acceleration, which for me is not just a question of hard power capabilities, which are very important, um, but also in our ability to make decisions together and make decisions quickly together. And so I think that's important in the context today when we see North Korea challenging right, the nuclear balance specifically. You see China challenging all of the kinds of uh, international law, uh, the maritime balance, all of the ways in which other speakers have outlined here. Uh, but we also see a debate in the United States that's re-examining the value of our alliances to us, right? And that makes many of our partners across the region quite nervous about our long-term sustainability in the region, but also our willingness to, 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 to move forward with allies to make sure the region is, is strong. The military-to-military -military cooperation in the U.S.-Japan alliance is extraordinary, and it's been extraordinary for generations. Um, and the US military and the Japanese military have deep, deep ties. And a lot of the evolution and the progress that we see here is due to the learning and the expansion of that learning over the decades, in particular in the wake of the Cold War. Um, we now have regular exercises in all kinds of dimensions that were unimaginable even five years ago. Uh, we do things together. We have planning coordination that spans from our regular long-term defense planning 
uh, to our nuclear posture review discussions, right? To our extended deterrence dialogue. So we have integrated considerably the way in which we think about the region and that we plan together. Um, there's been considerable security reforms, and this is an audience that knows them well, but the reforms in Tokyo make it much easier and much uh, uh, more rewarding to talk about what we need to do in the future. And the 2018 National Defense Program guideline has also put some money on the table, has made the resources available for the next five years in Tokyo, at least, for an expanded investment in capabilities there. Um, but I think what we need to do, and I think we've watched it uh, happen largely instigated by Tokyo and by the Abe cabinet, is we need to move the military coordination outside of the narrow framing. And again, everybody is talking about this in different ways, but outside the narrow framing of a defense of Japan scenario, uh, but into how do we build networks across the region where we continue to maintain open maritime sea lanes, but we also build on the kinds of collaborations that Patrick and others here have referenced, whether it's international application of international law, or whether it's things like uh, ISR coordination with Australia and other partners, whether it's the capacity building that we see ongoing by the Japanese and by, uh, has been to some extent by us in the Asia Pacific. Um, I think it's to be welcomed that there's a greater peacetime presence of the Japanese self-defense force across the region. I think we've seen some resistance in the past, but today there's a larger welcome for the maritime self-defense forces, for the air self-defense forces and ground self-defense force dialogue across the region, including India, uh, but also across uh, into the Persian Gulf and beyond. So what am I focused on? What am I worried about in terms of decision making? Or how do we look a little bit ahead? I think one of the, the key areas of reform, or at least building, that I see the potential for is how we imagine conflict in the region. We have largely talked about deterrence, and I think that is the primary objective of this alliance, is to prevent war. But I think we also need to make sure that we're prepared for it. And I think a lot of the ideas that we heard on this panel already have, have talked about specific ideas. I don't know that we completely understand each other when it comes to understanding how we see risk, how we assess risk, what instruments we can bring to bear, and how. I think, as I pointed out in my book, Japan Rearmed, the Japanese, are much, Japanese government is much more comfortable today with the military as an instrument of national strategy than they have been in the past, not as an aggressive uh, use of force, but as one that sustains the peace uh, more, more actively. I also think we could benefit from a conversation about how we see each other. What are the expectations of each other? And Minister Morimoto raised this uh, when he was discussing the host nation support debate. But we can talk about Article 5 and how we operationalize it, which again is a defense of Japan and a regional kind of way of talking about our military cooperation. To date, we have done it mission by mission. Ballistic missile defenses, island defenses, broader sea lanes missions. But I think it might be time to talk about it a little bit more broadly in terms of the great power competition that we've all been referencing. We don't have that strategic conversation and how we imagine uh, how we might best compete as an alliance uh, in that major power competition in, in Asia. The Korean Peninsula, of course, has long been the focal point of military planning. This is where we thought the use of force in Asia, or at least in Northeast Asia, was going to be most likely. But we've today in our conversation about it, even as we talk about diplomacy uh, and denuclearization, we still don't talk openly about how much the our ability to operate on the Korean Peninsula in the case of war depends on Japanese cooperation. And I think that's something I, I believe needs to be brought a little bit closer to the surface so that we can get to the conversation with South Korea about, if not shared command and control, because I, I, while I'd love to see it, I think it's a, it's a, it's a little bit of a reach at the moment. Um, but we do need to talk more openly about the, the value of both of those alliances together in how we manage the North. Um, China's strategic challenges have been talked about quite openly here, and I don't think we, I need to go any further than what we've talked about already. Um, I do think, though, that there's two pieces of the puzzle. One is making sure that our self-defense force operators are sure of and can count on our ability to respond should they need us, and that's a Senkaku contingency or other kind of contingency. I think we also need to be sure that our forward deployed bases in Japan can operate effectively. And that means making sure not just that the political 
environment is comfortable, but that also we have a, a serious conversation with the Japanese government about, about the operational requirements should we need to have a joint basing and joint use. Um, I think the broader stability of Asia one has been talked about quite a bit here, but I do think there's a lot of complementarity in the way in which we use instruments other than the military. And I'd like to see us, while we talk about Indo-Pacific, I'd like to see us get a lot more granular about economic resources, about soft power resources, and about how we can, as the United States, be much more forward-leaning uh, across the region. So in conclusion, I think we just need to remember that our job here in the alliance is to make sure that we continue to prevent war. And therefore, we make sure the alliance is strong. Um, we reassure each other. Here, I would go a little further than Takahashi-san. I don't think it's solely a roles, missions, and capabilities conversation, although I think that's very important. I think we need a higher level strategic dialogue. I think we need it at the higher level of decision making about the application of various instruments in our strategic development going forward, especially as we deal with China. And again, we need to prepare to act. I think resilience, strength, uh, is not just a military challenge, but I think it's an alliance challenge. And I think things can change, as we've seen in the last couple of weeks. Things on the ground uh, in the region could change quickly. It's not how we're used to thinking about the region. We're used to thinking about long-term planning processes. Uh, but I think we've learned our lesson in the last decade. Things can move very fast. And so I think we should talk very carefully about whether or not we are actually prepared to act together. Uh, and I think that's, that's one of the concerns I have about where we are and how we talk about our alliance. But I look forward to, to hearing General Gregson's thoughts. <laughs> thanks, Sheila. General. Uh, thank you very much. And thanks to the Hudson Institute for putting together this uh, essentially family reunion amongst uh, those of us Americans who have been privileged to work with Japan and some of our good Japanese friends that flew in here for the discussions. Uh, the question that was posed to us that led to vigorous analysis over the last two days was roles, missions, and something called multi-domain capabilities. Let me suggest that multi-domain has achieved official solid Washington buzzword status. <laughs> In that, I mean that it's very much more often discussed than it is understood. <laughs> so let me try and start with a definition, a simple working de definition of what multi-domain might mean and then how we might institute something practical very quickly to get the things that Sheila mentioned and the other speakers mentioned about actually making some progress on enhancing the security of Japan and the United States. Let me suggest we can understand multi-domain as that forces operating in each domain air, land, sea, space, cyberspace, uh, information, et cetera, uh, must provide direct support, fires, effects, and maneuver to all forces in every other domain at a pace much faster than any enemy can match. Uh, this is not optional for the alliance. Uh, we're fighting outnumbered, and fighting outnumbered requires integration across all these domains and integration, again, in a higher op operational tempo than any enemy can match. And this is not simple stuff. It's got to be done at the speed of electrons. Coordination is not fast enough. Voice radio is totally obsolete. It's got to be much more sophisticated than that. And it's got to be ingrained up here in the software, not just the hardware we use to communicate. This is tough stuff, both politically and practically. Politically, each nation must maintain solid sovereignty over its own forces, and the political imperatives of each nation must be respected throughout alliance operations. Northeast Asia presents a curious position for us now. Our regional force structure is, is much like it was at the beginning of the Cold War. We brought our forces back to Asia in response to the Soviet-sponsored invasion of South Korea. North Korea and China in those days had no ability to project forces to seaward, and therefore Korea became the battlefield and Japan remained the sanctuary. Chinese were involved, massive Chinese ground forces were involved in the active phase of the war in Korea, but the conflict stayed on the Korea. 
The Korean War, as you all know, is in an uneasy armistice. It's never really ended. Therefore, our forces in Korea, both U.S. and Korean, are prepared to fight tonight. They maintain that high a level of readiness. And more important to what we're talking about here, they will be fighting within and with an exquisite combined U.S.-Korean command and control network across the alliance that's capable of integrating fires and maneuver in real time across all those domains. China and North Korea can now project power to seaward. China is present in Japanese airspace and territorial waters frequently. North Korea frequently fires missiles provocatively into the Sea of China, and as far back as 1998, actually fired a missile over Japan. So Japan is no longer an unthreatened sanctuary. Deterrence, in turn, requires an undoubted ability to prevail. And deterrence, in its turn, requires that we enhance our capacity to integrate all of our forces across the alliance, across all these domains. This will require significant work. It must be done quickly, and we have to get it out of the conferences and get it into the forces where the younger generations can start working out all the details and, and solve problems for us. To do this, I propose that the U.S. has to provide an operationally capable joint U.S. command element in Japan that is charged with working daily continuously with Japanese counterparts to jointly develop plans, the organizations, the doctrine, and the skills needed to ensure alliance forces are ready to fight tonight for Japan as well as for Korea, joint and combined. Further, U.S. and Japanese forces should create a standing combined maritime joint task force. And maritime, as General Bancho mentioned, also includes the land, this isn't just strictly an Air Force Navy thing. Uh, a joint maritime standing task force is a platform and a laboratory for rapid development of capabilities and capacity. Other nations, but not limited, including but not limited to Australia, India, Singapore, and Taiwan, should join this standing combined task force as appropriate for various missions. Uh, humanitarian assistance disaster response is hardly a it's, it's considered an adjunct to what the military does, but let me propose that it's a hugely valuable characteristic. Number one, every disaster response operation exercises every military muscle, move, muscle group you have except for pulling a trigger, and that's conceptually the easiest. In the wake of Typhoon Haiyan in the Philippines, the Japanese were the second contingent to arrive to provide aid to the Philippines. The U.S. was first. We cheated. We flew down from Okinawa. Japanese brought down one of their great helicopter destroyer ships with not only soldiers on it, but with professional non-governmental organizations that specialize in disaster response. Three months later, I listened to the Philippine ambassador to Japan addressing a public conference, openly depart from his talking points and say that we consider Japan an ally. We're the Philippines. We know there was a war here 70 years ago. We had a part in it but we now consider Japan an ally. So that's the type of thing that can change with one of these. Our friends in Taiwan can join this task force uh, for, humanita for disaster response operations, and therefore we help to eliminate uh, a bit of the isolation of Taiwan. Looking beyond the immediate area of Japan, we can use this combined maritime joint task force organization to take advantage of the expansion of our alliance presence to Guam. Besides moving American forces to Guam, there is a subsequent agreement that talks about Guam and all that that says the United States will provide for the continuous presence in the Japanese forces in Guam, and by extension, the Commonwealth of the Northern Marianas, and by extension to the three compact states, the Federated States of Micronesia, the Republic of Palau, and the Republic of the Marshalls, uh, that are in a compact of free association with the United States. The advantage to that is they are obliged to meet our needs for defense. They have vast 
sea and air training areas in this area of the, area of the Pacific. It's relatively unencumbered by commercial traffic, relatively unencumbered with frequency usage. There's no better way to learn how to fight a combined fight to defend an archipelago of 6,852 islands, which according to National Geographic is what Japan has, uh, than in an archipelagic area where it's friendly. And oh, by the way, the Belt and Road Initiative, which Patrick mentioned, moves east as well as it, it, other directions. Our, our occasional but frequent presence in these island countries there helps to maintain our influence in the face of the Chinese onslaught with their, uh, with their monetarily uh, um, grounded uh, diplomacy in these islands. Um, the, there's, there's two initiatives that were announced by PACOM that, that fit within this, and I submit this will fit the other way. Admiral Davidson's most recent, recent posture statement called on everybody to, quote, operationalize, there's another Washington buzzword for you, <laughs> operationalize multi-domain and distributed operations concepts. Okay, you take this wide area of all these islands here, we can practice distributed aviation operations, the logisticians can figure out how to disaggregate logistics to get, to get fuel and spare parts to different isolated places. Uh, and if this is our objective for the first island train, it, chain, like I said, we need to train in, the, in this type of archipelago. Admiral Davidson also launched something called his Pacific Multi-Domain uh, Training and Experimentation Capability Initiative. What this means is he's advocating connecting all the different training areas we already use in a live, virtual, constructive, artificial intelligence, computer-enhanced uh, reality, which saves money. It's a way to train without burning gasoline or, or ammunition or, or flight hours or steaming hours. It's also a way where we can test without hazard to troops or to civilians some of the different concepts we're talking about here. Uh, I fear that remaining in a status quo and with some justification talking about the alliance has never been in better shape, the alliance has never been in better condition, et cetera, et cetera, that the rest of the world's not waiting for our self-congratulation or the rest of the world is moving on, threats are developing. North Korea may be, uh, by, by virtue of some of the tech, by some of the trajectories that have been detected by Japan on their most recent missile launches, may be developing hypersonic capability. Uh, we can't stand still and we can't uh, just continue to talk about things at the theoretical level, at the academic level. We've got to drive this down to the practical level and get something. Last point on this standing, on this command element in Japan, a reaction that you get from inside the U.S. military and the bureaucracy on this all the time is, oh, God, the system can't absorb another four-star subunified command, another buzzword. <laughs> By all means, do not make the commander of this thing a four-star. Leave it at the three-star level, believe me. And a three-star will know he's working for PACOM, so that take care of, takes care of PACOM's objections to this. Secondly, you already have at least two three-star commands in Japan that are certified by the Indo-Pacific Command as being, quote, joint task force nucleus capable, which means that you fly in an augmentation cell from PACOM to fill in the skills they don't have. For example, you... you well, I'm not going to go to an example on this, but, but cyber would be one, I guess. You, you fly in the augmentation cell, you get a fully qualified joint headquarters. And you got it for no a, a, a special uh, uh, additional expenses otherwise. The advantage of doing this training mission with a headquarters that's already in Japan is that despite all the wonders of email, despite all the wonders of video teleconferencing and everything, Nothing beats eyeball to eyeball contact, handshake contact on a daily basis to build the trust that is really the foundation of powerful alliance combined action because without the person to person trust, you've got theory. You need to have that person to person understanding so when things don't go according to plan, things can work. Uh, it was mentioned before uh, by our, our moderator that uh, General Bancho was uh, key in the response to the 311 disaster. We put, U.S. and Japan put together two ad hoc headquarters very quickly, and it only worked because everybody knew each other. You, 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 you can't do it otherwise. Now we need to drive that. Everybody knows each other down to a lower level 
and particularly down to where you're talking about the defense of the Southwest Islands, with, which include the Senkaku, so that you have the U.S. and Japanese fighting in a, a, the same fight in a collective defense rather than just fighting the same way the same day. Thank you. Great. Thanks. Please join me in giving the whole panel a round of applause. And thanks to all of you for, for your great questions. We only have about 15 minutes, so, so we'll probably get to two of these. I'll try, to, I'll try to link a couple of them together. First of all, there, there are several questions on, on given the, the common and serious threat that many of you described, a threat that transcends defense-only considerations and, and, and demands an integration of all elements of national power and multinational cooperation across political action and financial and law enforcement and informationals, as, as, uh, as Patrick uh, emphasized, uh, what other types of security consultations, diplomatic consultations, would help achieve a better integrated approach to this broad range of challenges? General Gregson already gave us a tremendous recommendation, a very concrete recommendation, for how to, to integrate military to military efforts, which of course will be placed in this broader context. But a related question then is, as well is that, is that, uh, is that how do we organize? How do we organize so we can operate more effectively across all domains? And I'm not using that in the, in the context of multi-domain warfare, but, but really across all of the informational, uh, diplomatic, law enforcement, military, uh, military, cyber, and so forth uh, domains. So I'd like to just open up to the panel and see who would like to take on that question. Well, HR, I mean, two things that the United States should do would be to run the NSC the way you ran it in the Scowcroft <laughs> model, working with yachi san at the time in terms of a national security dialogue, and then to, and to mobilize all of our um, sort of departments and, and ministries around a, the common purpose that you would set out. Um, and, and once you set the parameters, the requirements, if you will, you know, then you, you, you make sure they're all working on this. And that's, so rather than tell them how to do it, you tell them the, the common objective, and then you constantly monitor them to try to push them for results and see whether we can't come up with lots of specific ideas from, from the bureaucracies of the two countries. Great. Thank you. Sheila. Just a footnote. I think that's a great idea. I think the NSS, NSC, new conversation at that level is really critical. And the point is, can we institutionalize it going forward? And that, you know, that will depend largely on the Japanese side and, and on us. But, but at the personal level, I think that's one, one channel. But I agree. I think what we want is a short-term, high-level strategic focus on what is our strategy, right? What, do, what kind of Asia do we want to see? And I would, I would like to see this outside the 2 plus 2. I think the 2 plus 2 is a great mechanism. And I don't, I'm not here to denigrate it. 2005, they identified common strategic objectives for the alliance. And, and this is this is the Minister of Defense, Minister and of Foreign Affairs, with our Secretary of State, Secretary of Defense. Right. The periodic meetings happen quite frequently, actually. Right, and those are regularized, and they're much more frequent now than they were in the past, and I think that's excellent. But I'm thinking of a short-term political focus on what should our strategy be, what are our objectives, and then again, as Patrick suggested, then let the principles implement going forward. Great. Thank you. And I have two comments. One thing is, I totally agree with General Gregson's uh, emphasis on the personal relations. Yeah. And the, even with personal relations, mutual understanding is not an easy thing. I was inside the government in 2010 Senka crisis and 2012 Senka crisis. We were surprised that the basic, how to say, our basic thought is not necessarily shared with the yeah. theory. So to share that, you know, we need to how to say, talk and talk and talk and talk again. And the, and so, so this is one thing. The, the other thing is maybe the coming great power, coming ongoing great power competition is really wide range issue. Mm -hmm. and my thought is uh, there are four power resources. That's the technology, capital, and the resource, and the location. And the military, for, military balance is actually deep pedal tone for, uh, for these uh, power resources. So in a sense, how to say, I think uh, we should be humble that the coordination of these, these comprehensive power resources related each, each, each country's activity is very difficult to <coughs> manage. So uh, I think we should, not, we should abandon some kind of illusion that we can grasp everything. So we, want to, we, we need to share the, how to say, a kind of basic design or the basic direction for the competition. But uh, we cannot, I think, I don't think we can manage 
uh, these, for, for example, resource or capital related competition. Thank, thank you. Joe Bonsha. I would like to clarify the three parts. One is the strategic goals or common strategic concept. So that the purpose or goal should be divided, should be so uh, understood together. That is the maybe most important thing. Mm -hmm. Second is in the daily basis situation awareness, such as the common operational picture or so. So we understand together what is happened, what is the situation. Such kind of the scheme might be very important. Third is the structure. So General Gregson said uh, joint and uh, bilateral permanent headquarter or uh, organization uh, must be very, very important and necessary, especially when I was the commanding of the Western areas. That is the automatically need jointness mm. because remote island and the wide areas. So uh, information should be so uh, collected and shared by all services and U.S. together. So uh, permanent, such kind of so, uh, commanding or command structure uh, might be useful, I think. Thank, Thank you, General. General Gregson? I don't have anything to one? add to that. No. Okay, great. Uh, so so uh, the other, the other uh, questions had to do with, uh, with the problem set associated with North Korea. You know, one, one of the questions alludes to this, <laughs> the idea that you know, we have to at least be open to the possibility that Kim Jong-un wants to keep them. <laughs> and so, so if, if, uh, if, that is, if, if that is really what he wants to do, any recommendations from the panel on how we can uh, give our best shot, really, at the implementation of this strategy of maximum pressure, this idea of, of at least testing the thesis, right, that, uh, that Kim Jong-un could be convinced, perhaps, that he is, he is safer without them than he is with them, any ideas on how to integrate efforts across, you know, across political, diplomatic, Military, uh, informational, and so forth on on uh, on, New on North Korea, and uh, and then there's also a question about a potential contingency in the Senkakus should China become very aggressive there and in fact you know, try to 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 make a, a land grab of some kind uh, in the Senkakus, which is what some people are some of the, one of the questioners said is kind of a worst case scenario. Um, how well is, is Japan and our how well is our alliance? Uh, prepared to to deal with that contingency. So, so uh, two bad scenarios. Any comments on either of those? Yeah, yeah. Let me jump on this from the freedom of somebody who used to be in the government and now has his First <laughs> Amendment rights back. And, uh, on, on this, the um, if North Korea did not have nuclear weapons, nobody would pay any attention to them. <laughs> North Korea did not stumble into this accidentally. This has been an ongoing program since A.Q. Khan was stealing British secrets and giving it to the Pakistanis and then took this operation, uh, entrepreneurial and was sharing nuclear material, nuclear uh, technology and nuclear knowledge uh, to North Korea, Iran, and there was somebody, uh, Pakistan, of course. Uh, this has been going on, he, he, and he openly confessed to this in 1974 and he'd been doing it for decades prior to that. Um, Secondly, it's hard to think of anything that Kim Jong-un is going to believe that we tell him is stronger is a stronger security guarantee than his possession of nuclear weapons. He was in school in Switzerland when Gaddafi was uh, met his end in a ditch in Libya. Uh, he internalized that both at the personal level and both at the maintaining his position and leadership within North Korea level, he's not going to give these up. We need to redefine our objective nationally as working harder to secure the lives, the territory, and the interest of our two primary allies, Japan and South Korea, in the face of a nuclear North Korea than we do in trying to go all in on personal diplomacy, uh, 1v1, to find some miraculous uh, benefit that, that Kim is going to accept for giving up his nuclear weapons. North Korea is a nuclear armed state. Like every other nuclear armed state, he, he can be deterred and contained. And that's what we have to work on. 
Technology can work in our favor in this. Uh, there's things under development that will greatly enhance our ability to defeat any North Korean attack on Japan. Uh, former Defense Minister Morimoto, I believe, was the first one in this session to men mention boost phase intercept. This is entirely possible. It's entirely possible in a relatively short term. It means that we're able to defeat a North Korean missile in its most vulnerable phase when it can't maneuver, when it's struggling to get out of the atmosphere. And oh, by the way, we're destroying it over North Korea, which is really a wonderful thought. If Kim can no longer have confidence that he can strike Japan <coughs> successfully, then it takes his massive investment and his grandfather's investment, et cetera, uh, massive investment in these missiles and, and nuclear weapons and reduces it nearly to zero. No defense is perfect, but this really lowers his potential to threaten Japan and, oh, by the way, to threaten South Korea, too. So that's, I, I, I think we're, it, it doesn't mean we have to accept the moral right of North Korea to have nuclear weapons. It doesn't mean we have to uh, sanction their ownership of these things. It does mean that somewhere in the inner sanctums of our policy making, we need to realize that our real objective here is not denuclearization of North Korea. It's to, it's, it's to enhance the security of Japan and South Korea, which, oh, by the way, also enhances our security. Thank you. Thanks, Rob. I would say, first and foremost, we never acknowledged uh, North Korea as a nuclear power, and that's implicitly what you said. But a nuclear I'll, weapon state. A nuclear weapon state. Okay. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> I'm not I saying think, we have to agree with it. We just got to... But I don't want... Yeah, I think we want to... of objective reality. Yeah. We want to be clear about our declaratory side of things. And I think the second is the United States should stop distinguishing between the missile threat to our allies and the missile threat to the United States. Yes. I understand it. I understand the political reasons for it. And I understand that it's seen as a tool towards keeping the negotiation door open. But I think probably given the latest test and the frequency of testing, I think it's time to stop. Like any missile testing by North Korea should be condemned by us. I, I think the other, the harder point, and General McMaster referred to this, is how do we keep the international coalition together on the sanctions side of things? Japan has been very insistent. China and Russia are pushing back hard. Uh, President Moon is, is, is also considering you know, how to manage the sanctions issue. I think we want to be very clear about maximum pressure and sanctions unless we see uh, North Korea coming to us with very specific uh, itineraries, inventories of its capabilities. I think we need to be much harder on this um, and not so flexible. So those are my three diplomatic options or statements. Thank you. Thank you, Shiro. Yes. You know, back to the early 2017, uh, when, no, 18, when the diplomacy coming back to the table, at that time still there was some skepticism that North Korea is, uh, North Korea is just as well as past behaviors, North Korea is just want to buy time. And the other <laughs> observation was now, now North Korea made a strategic decision that now they are ready to uh, start the denuclearization. And the two years has passed. Mm -hmm. I mean, the has said, which observation was correct was, I think, so obvious. I mean, now, it's, now it's very fair to see North Korean two year strategy is just to buy the time. And uh, so, uh, if that's, that is, maybe that's true, unfortunately, uh, then what we need to do is to, we need to, we don't need to, we, uh, sorry. We should not waste the time which is bought by North Korea. We need to utilize these, these times to reinforce or to establish our, to strengthen our deterrence or uh, damage, <coughs> damage limitation postures. So, and the, you know, last year's North Korea missile launch is uh, basically a test for maneuverable warhead, which is, which can penetrate the first generation missile defense system. So now we need to update our missile defense system, maybe 1.5 generation or 2.2 second generation. So uh, of course the software should be updated, and but not just that, directed to energy or boost phase defense should be uh, sh sh seriously started. You know, the current first generation missile defense system's basic architecture were uh, formed in late, 19, late 1990, at the time of the uh, Clinton administration. And 15 years were, were required to develop the, uh, our, uh, how to say, a kind of reliable defense posture. So maybe the second generation requires the same, same time, same time. So we should start uh, these efforts to develop the second generation missile defense as soon as possible. So not to waste 
the time which is bought by North Korea. Thank you. Mr. General. Out of the <coughs> Korean situation, I remember the 1950. What, re, what was the <coughs> similarity and what is the difference? <coughs> similarity is <coughs> still Japanese territory or Japan is a very important areas. Between the Busan and the Tsushima mm -hmm. island, northern uh, island of the Kyushu, was only 49 kilometers, very, very close. That is the line of communication between two connected with the uh, Korean Peninsula and Japan. So uh, if the uh, situation will happen in North Korea, Japan have to assume the very important role to support the operation. So that is the similarity. But the difference is, uh, so Sugiyo-san said, based on the North Korean missile capabilities and the nuclear capabilities. That is tremendously different. And their special forces capabilities or cyber capabilities, such kind of the new capabilities is a new threat and a new so a challenge for us. So that's why uh, we have to do both in order to cooperate. And at the time, Japan, US, and the South Korean cooperation is essential. So uh, uh, at this moment, uh, the Japan and South Korean relation is uh, very naive, but we have to improve immediately. And uh, such kind of the trilateral consultation framework or close coordination, close cooperation must be needed. And as of the Senkaku issues, there is the, so uh, to avoid the Chinese trick, uh, we, we do not uh, so uh, excess, uh, escalate the, the situation. So uh, we need a very important uh, effort, and uh, we have to keep the uh, law enforcement activities and uh, supported by military. And uh, uh, of course, US support. Thank mm -hmm. you. So HR, when you think about the threats and adversaries you identified in the national security strategy, um, it's Russia and Iran who, over the last decade, have practiced more than political warfare, that is, with lethal results, um, using covert war, paramilitary means, um, cyber war, and so on. China and North Korea, and North Korea since the end of 2010, has not they've not used lethal force. No, they've used cyber attacks, they've used political warfare. So our main mission with North Korea and with China is to make sure that we deter those two adversaries, potentially, from escalating from political warfare to hybrid warfare to actual kinetic use as a force that kill people. Um, we can do that. We've done it, but we can't do it standing still. But we also don't want to spend all of our budget on North Korea. We want to deal with the long-term challenges that I talked about in total competition. So we need, while keeping the door open for diplomacy, we have to admit that a two-year arc of experimental diplomacy, of keeping the door open and achieving what little we've achieved, or even backward progress in some cases, um, means that North Korea is not eager to take meaningful steps toward denuclearization. So, okay, we'll keep that door open for the future. Meanwhile, we need to dial back some of that pressure. Um, some of the means that we can do this were identified recently by a great report by David Maxwell and others um, at FDD, where you were also associated. Um, and um, while we're doing... Dial it up. Dial, I'm sorry, dial up, uh, dial up, back up. up the pressure. Yes, I'm sorry, yes. I yes. oh, were going soft. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> dial down the diplomacy, dial up the pressure. I apologize. It's, it's late. I'm affected by the snow in Washington. Um, <laughs> you and the government. Yes. Um, the government so, so we can we can do this. It's a serious issue for um, the U.S. and Japan. It's also especially difficult, and this is the difficult part, for th three um, democracies uh, in Seoul, Tokyo, and Washington to stay on the same page. So. You know, uh, Sheila is rightly employing us to stay on the same, you know, strategic message. You know, Japan and U.S. Yeah. now introduce the Korean dimension of that South Korean dimension, and that's the real uh, challenge for us. Because North Korea will be looking for the seams in that, and they may miscalculate. They may attack Japan, thinking, ah, they're the odd man out. They can't go offensive. America may not quickly rush in. Where will South Korea be? So we have to make sure that they never see that opportunity. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, I get to get a chance to wrap up tonight and to, to say on behalf of Ken Weinstein, 
Thanks to all of you for coming. Thanks for this amazing panel. I'd like to offer just a couple of points, if I could. I know we're just two minutes over on, on North Korea. I just think that it's important for us to consider, first of all, what is motivating Kim Jong-un and the Kim regime you know, across multiple generations to pursue this capability. General Gregson mentioned one, one of these, uh, but I think it may also be why they say that they want it, which is to have this treasured sword as a way of cleaving the alliance between South Korea and the United States as, as the first step in isolating Japan. And so we have the danger of, of a North Korea with a nuclear weapon, because they might use it with a missile, but it also means that they could use it for extortion or nuclear blackmail. The other aspect of this is what General Gregson mentioned with the AQ Khan network, is the, is the potential of proliferation. I think North Korea would be much more dangerous than AQ Khan, because they are, they've never met a weapon they didn't try to sell to somebody. They have, they, have an, they have an organized crime network, which is their main way to generate hard currency, that globally already, and by the way, they were building a weapons facility, weapons grade uh, nuclear facility in Syria for the Assad regime, financed by who? The Iranians. So I, I think that proliferation is a real danger, uh, as, as well as, you know, there could be a cataclysmic event associated with what if they decide to ser sell it to a, a terrorist organization, right? So, so I, I think it is in our interest to ratchet up the, the pressure because. Maximum pressure has never really ever happened, right? The, the UN Security Council resolutions have an unprecedented uh, degree of sanctions in place, but they're not enforced. So North Korean slave laborers, so-called guest workers, have not yet been expelled from China and, and Russia, for example. The ship-to-ship -ship transfers continue. Why can't we work hard to get the legal authority or just do it under Article 2 to interdict those ship-to-ship -ship transfers? There are, there are many more things we can do. I think one of the things we can do is to strengthen our alliance and also to strengthen our alliance with South Korea and also to mend the relationship between, between South Korea and Japan. I, I, I th when, with my, my, my counterparts, my, my Japanese South Korean counterparts, we took a pledge with each other. We said, we want China to see that every provocation is driving us closer together. And that as a way to incentivize China, who has not a North Korea strategy, but a U.S. strategy, again, to, to, to get us off the peninsula, to isolate Japan. So I, I think we ought to prioritize, really, our defense capabilities, as we've been talking about today, but really diplomatically, to, to, to send that strong message that Patrick mentioned. I, just, I can't tell you how much I learned today from this, this panel. I just wanted to share you, with you the construct I will take away from this, from my own notes. I think what we heard today is that we need to do four really key tasks together as an alliance. We need to think, learn, analyze, and implement. We have to think clearly about the problem of future armed conflict, and we have to <clears throat> think clearly so that we can, you know, we can develop, we can develop a conceptual foundation, which all of our speakers mentioned. Uh, for, you know, for, uh, for maturing our alliance and, and the capabilities associated with, with our alliance. We have to learn. We have to learn in a collaborative, sustained, and cumulative rather than you know, repetitive manner. And, and so uh, teams that can do that, such as the, the, the headquarters that General Gregson mentioned and other, other organizations we can, we can come up with. Because as, as, we, as we, we learn through the situational awareness that we can uh, have together, uh, we, can, we can then, I think, identify, we can identify the gaps in our capabilities and the opportunities to improve our capabilities. And then, of course, we have to analyze what we learn. We have to analyze so we can develop integrated solutions that are not just military, joint, you know, multi-domain military solutions, but also political and informational and law enforcement and, and cyber and so forth uh, uh, so solutions to, to these, these gaps and to these opportunities. And then we have to get it done, as, as all of our speakers, I think, which is really refreshing. Uh, you know, this is, this, is a, this is a think tank here at Hudson that does tremendous work, I think, because as, for years as, as a military officer and, and in my job as national security advisor, I could take any Hudson product and I would know what to do with it because there was a bridge into implementation. <laughs> you know, so, and, 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 uh, and so I, I think, uh, uh, I think we, we owe our panelists a, a great debt of gratitude and, and, and to Hudson for putting this together. And, and please join me in a round of applause. Thanks.
takes way back when I first...